Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I am so delighted to welcome you this evening to our program, Effective Public History with David Young. My name is Justina Barrett. I am newly the Director of Education and Programs at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. HSP was founded in 1824 and proudly serves as Philadelphia's Library of U.S. History. Our collection contains 21 million manuscripts encompassing centuries of history. We are the proud stewards of many national treasures. The first and second handwritten drafts of the U.S. Constitution, William Still's Underground Railroad Journal C, and the first photograph taken in the United States. So a little bit of housekeeping before we get started and before I turn it over to Dr. David Young. We are recording tonight's program, and we will be sending a follow-up email that has that recording, and ultimately that recording will also go to our YouTube page. We are saving time at the end for your questions, but you can go ahead and start populating the Q&A box with those questions. Please use the, the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. We will be using the chat to share some links and other resources as we go through the night. So I think we have a good quorum here. We could get started. Um, tonight, we will be talking about the practice of public history in our region and some of its, its challenges and its triumphs. Locally, there is no one better to lead that discussion than David Young. David, do you want to say hi? Come off mute for a second. Hi, everyone, and thanks for having me, and thanks for participating in this evening's program. It's good to be here with you. Dr. Young has led historical organizations in our Mid-Atlantic region uh, at the Salem County Historical Society, the Johnson House Historic Site, Cliveden of the National Trust, and winning local and national awards for his work there. Currently, he's the executive director at the Delaware Historical Society. Uh, Dr. Young received his bachelor's degree uh, from Northwestern University and his master's and PhD from Ohio State University. He is the author of The Battles of Germantown, Effective Public History in America from Temple University Press published in 2019. This was awarded the 2020 Philip Klein Prize uh, by the Pennsylvania Historical Association for the best book about Pennsylvania. We're going to put that resource in the chat, and we're going to be talking more about it this evening. David, thank you for being with us. I am so excited to get started. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you now. I remind folks that they can start populating the Q&A anytime something comes into their mind as you're talking. We will be saving some time at the end, but let's get this started. I'm going to turn it over to you, David. Thank you, and I feel especially pleased to be here with uh, my good friend and colleague, Justina Barrett, and I wanna dedicate this lecture to you and your success in your new position as Director of Education and Public Programs at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And I bring greetings from the lower county. So it's very good to be here with you all um, because there are many connections, whether they be about revolutionary history, underground railroad history, plantation, the plant, mid-Atlantic plantation economy or uh, the ways that historical societies can inform the public discussion about ways to make history useful. So I, what I'd like to do tonight is talk a little bit about the book and some of the choices we made and some of the ways that Germantown is an especially uh, salient place to examine the role of public history in America and what effect of public history is can be traced back to the last century of Germantown's preservationists and historians. And then um, I'd like to talk a little bit about a couple of the examples from chapters of the book, uh, give you a general idea of what we're doing in, in, uh, at the Delaware Historical Society, where lessons and, and applications of effective public history are being used in our communities, uh, and then talk about one specific project in particular. And then we'll open up, up for uh, questions and answers. So thank you very much for sharing part of your uh, busy holiday midweek uh, with us and um, on with the show. So I'm going to share my screen now uh, and get to uh, a little bit about um, what effective public history is and how it serves the cause of social justice. 
The book title is The Battles of Germantown, Effective Public History in America. And um, um, it can serve the cause of social justice in numerous ways by seeking partnerships, uh, uh, bringing up-to-date up research to the public for experiential approaches that, uh, that include different kinds of perspectives. Effective public history in a way is about affecting change and not only seeing it from one perspective, but encouraging experiential learning that um, can see it from a variety of perspectives. Uh, the title and the, the, the cover uh, deserve some explanation because this is not a military history uh, and it is not only about um, a Germantown, but really how we think about history in America and uh, Germantown and why it's especially a, a great place to examine it because what happens in Germantown has happened to a lot of older communities. And so how we think about preservation and integrity and authority and what gets remembered and how to involve people uh, in what gets remembered, especially as a neighborhood or a community may change is part of what effective public history is. One way to think, one way to define um, historic preservation is as the responsible management of change. And um, the, the, the battles refer to the conflicts that come from managing change. Historical societies, museums, particularly uh, house museums of which there are several in Germantown are notoriously slow to change or notoriously exclusive and the ways that they can be more effective and affect change is the process of inclusion and encouraging diverse viewpoints. And that, um, that takes a, a, a lot of work and it's intentional, but it can also be bruising and time consuming. So there are numerous battles throughout the book that are really about public and private contentions related to the topics of each chapter. The cover is a classic uh, um, uh, example from uh, Philadelphia's public history works of the last few years. This is from the Monuments Lab, Monument Lab uh, project of a few years ago, 2017, in fact, where uh, artists were encouraged to take over uh, public art installations throughout Philadelphia. And this was the one done in Vernon Park, Germantown's de facto Central Park. Uh, and it was a Battle of Germantown monument from the, eight, uh, from the 1777 battle commemorating the Battle of uh, Germantown in 1777, installed in 1903 in part because the Jews would now not allow it to be installed at Clibden. It was covered over in the summer of 2017 when there were a lot of uh, contested discussions about the role of monuments in America and, and taking down Confederate monuments. Um, and it was the summer of Charlottesville and the Unite the Right rally in August of, uh, of 2017 when Heather Heyer was killed at the Unite the Right rally. Um, and so it, it, it gives a good snapshot of what effective public history is. It's in the public, it's in the public square, and it invites us to reflect ourselves together. Much of the way we learn about uh, uh, things at museums is socially, uh, and studies will show that um, it's not so much looking at the artifact or reading the label that is how we learn, but in fact, how we talk about it together as a group. So the book is really about uh, de defining public history in a new way and seizing its very public aspect, its very social aspect. We can't know all we want to know about history uh, except from one another. We can learn more from it, including different perspectives on the past. Uh, the uh, effective history is actually uh, comes from the hermeneutics uh, in German philosophy that uh, really describes you are affecting what you observe. You change by observing something um, and it becomes a little bit more subjective through observation. You bring biases or prejudices to what you observe. And that's certainly the case in the past. And historians started to call it effective history because you affect what you're looking at with your own perspectives or biases or, or a heritage. And effective public history is uh, really about how we learn from one another in an experience, in dialogue, in varieties of ways, sensory ways, for instance, that we can share the experience of the past and learn a little bit more from each other's perspectives and not only reinforce our own. It seeks, uh, effective public history seeks to inform and provoke discussion rather than affirm.
So effective public history, a good example I would give uh, of what this means is if I were to ask all of you to make a mixtape or a Spotify list of 10 songs about something like the South or 1968, and you came up with your 10 songs and then we started to, to look at them, we might notice that there were very personal selections. That's effective history. That's Wirkungsgeschichte. You've brought your personal perspective to 1968. Maybe it's the year of your birth or the year your folks were married. And so you have songs associated with it. Maybe it's songs only from 1968, but they would, would reflect your own perspective. Effective public history is if we would share our lists and consider the choices that were made in selecting those lists. And we'd see that it didn't necessarily add up to a history of 1968. And we'd look at those gaps and discuss what's missing or what else could be made from it. And effective public history would be the dance party that results from it, the experience of that together. So this uh, cover image by a of a Germantown artist, Karen Olivier, is also a good reminder that all the lessons in Germantown also have great resources, literature, and historic preservation track records that give us opportunities for solution. The literature in Germantown is vast and it spans everything from ethnography and sociology to children's literature and economic planning studies to say nothing of the historic structures reports and primary documents associated with the various sites. I worked at the Johnson House as the first director from 2004 to 2006, and I worked at Cliveden from 2006 until 2018. So um, Germantown is a neighborhood in Philadelphia, six to six and a half miles away from Center City. It com it's comprised, or it, it fills up uh, Ward 22 in the city of Philadelphia. The German Township includes Chestnut Hill, Mount Airy, and Germantown. For the purposes of this study, uh, I've, taken, I, I've looked at the history of Germantown through the, uh, the, the, the museums and historic sites that are open and available to the public on America's longest national colonial historic district, the two mile stretch of Germantown Avenue from Upsell Street to, uh, to Stenton uh, at Windrum Avenue. It also includes uh, um, other sites. So the traditional way of historic, uh, of Germantown's preservation fits much of the patterns of preservation and public history throughout the country. And that was usually done by ancestors, uh, or, or excuse me, descendants of ancestors who had founded Germantown or the local communities associated with specific houses. So the, uh, it's, it shouldn't be a surprise that of the 18 sites in historic Germantown, seven of which are national historic landmarks, uh, the historic Germantown consortium includes sites that are stewarded by local and national uh, or preservation organizations that are themselves descendant based. So the National Society for Colonial Dames in Pennsylvania runs uh, Stenton, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Society for the Preservation of Philadelphia Landmarks uh, runs, owns and operates Grumblethorpe. Uh, but there are also other national stewards like the National Park Service, which runs the Germantown White House and the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which runs Cliveden. And that means that there are also uh, competing and overlapping uh, ways of approaching the past, depending on the, the parent company of the preservation organization. This is the 150th anniversary of the Battle of Germantown and the, and, uh, the, the descendants dressed up in their ancestors' clothing to represent the sesquicentennial of the Battle of Germantown in 1927. This is not unusual uh, in, in, in other organizations and other parts across the country, people dressed in their ancestors' clothing to honor their ancestors. But this meant an exclusive idealized version of the past based on remembering a specific version of our people, a specific definition of our people. And Germantown has that with the many different uh, organizations. Uh, it's not uh, without noting that Germantown's first historian was also in many ways Philadelphia's John Fanning Watson, who lived in Germantown and worked in Germantown. And the Watson effect idealizes the past, but in a way that's nostalgic and somewhat bitter um, because it, it, it highlights the past in a way that overlooks the present. And that descendant-based exclusive history met its logical endpoint in this 1983 image which is the 
uh, the, the, the 300th anniversary of the founding of Germantown in 1683, when a parade was held by historic Germantown Preserve that even brought up the West German Bundes president, Karl von Karstens, who came up to Germantown along with many German journalists in uh, the spring of 1983, expecting to see a quaint colonial German village. And instead they see Germantown as it is in 1983, uh, impoverished, blighted. It's the moment crack had arrived in the neighborhood. And here were descendants of Prussian military officers in a parade celebrating the 300th anniversary of Germantown. Uh, this is a case where my, in, my knowledge of German comes in handy because the 10 page article in the Zeit magazine, which is a, in effect the New York Times Sunday magazine's equivalent in Germany. Uh, in 1983, it, it's 10 pages described Germantown as the historic dregs of the city of brotherly love. And the effective public history efforts of the last generation have in large part tried to undo this uh, legacy of just being an exclusive um, memory uh, 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 organization because what had happened is the largely African-American population of Germantown, it, it now is 73% African-American, was not included in its markers, monuments, and museums. Its memory infrastructure, the monuments, the markers, and the museums did not reflect the community as the community changed. And when that happens, a kind of cynicism develops. And I'll remind you that many of these uh, historic houses are behind gates or behind stone walls, and they're rather off-putting to the community. So the community may not know what's actually behind there. And it certainly doesn't see itself represented in the colonial or sometimes Victorian memory infrastructure. And even things like the 1688 protest against slavery, which Germantown's Mennonites and Quakers developed in, in 1688, it, it's not celebrating black people or enslaved people, it's celebrating the Quakers and the Mennonites. And it brings up a couple of the paradoxes in the, in the preservation of such important legacies. And that is that the, Quake, the memory of the Quakers' uh, 1688 protest is all well and good, but Germantown's Quaker meeting did not allow blacks in until the 1940s. Those paradoxes are especially important to consider because they're very dramatic in Germantown. So this image was never far from my desk. This is not effective public history. The last generation of stewards in Germantown has really been working to engage the community and broaden that memory infrastructure, evolve it and extend it organically with community participation and expert involvement based on new findings or new ways of telling even the stories we understand very well like the Battle of Germantown, for instance. So uh, this image is an important image to keep in mind because we've been undoing it ever since with collaboration, with getting out into community uh, 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 um, associations and being at the table with important discussions. Each of the chapters of the book uh, reflects some kind of economic imperative because some of the house museums were closing in Germantown or merging. Um, or, or and history was very much a threat. Loudoun has closed, Uppsala closed because it had single digit visitation in this century. So uh, new models had to be found. The chapters, the five chapters of the book, and the book, by the way, is written in the first person. So it's, it's, it, it's a personal viewpoint, therefore it's limited, but it is that of a practitioner's perspective. And it, it is not a comprehensive history of Germantown, but it invites, the consideration of how personal all our preservation efforts are or all our considerations of the past are. It starts subjectively, but effective public history can bring it out a little bit. The chapters are conversations, amnesia, uh, authority, integrity, and projections. And just about any community in America has experience with these. Um, these are the, the, the and because it's a first person account, it's also limited and it's already out of date. Uh, so there are now 18 historic sites of historic Germantown. This is the map that covers 16 of them and it, it goes down to historic Fairhill on Germantown Avenue. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about uh, some items in the first chapter conversations because it gets to the collections of the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. This is the site where I, I worked for 12 years. It's Cliveden of the National Trust located on Cliveden Street. 
Cliveden on Cliveden Street. And the reason um, uh, um, that it was known as Cliveden on Cliveden Street, because it's because people in the neighborhood, rich, poor, black or white, young or old, knew it as the Chew Mansion on Cliveden Street. So it really is Cliveden on Cliveden. And this is the traditional interpretation. A large battle occurred there in the morning of October 4, 1777. And um, it was reenacted from 1977 on under the uh, generosity of, the, uh, of Jack Asher and the Asher uh, Chocolates Company, a Germantown firm. Uh, but it was also uh, you know, uh, 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 preserved as a historic site and a sacred relic of the Battle of Germantown, which represented about three hours in the history of the community, but it drew a large gravitational pull of what got remembered and considered important. The furnishings of the Chu family, the Chu family had moved, uh, who lived uh, at Cliveden until 1972 when it was turned over to the National Trust to become a museum and it opened in 1973. The furnishings, the documents, the architecture, the history of the Chu's related to Benjamin Chu, one of the most powerful legal officers in Pennsylvania, a chief justice, an attorney general, at one point even a city councilman. Uh, um, he was, uh, uh, he drew a, 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 a large, um, he threw a large shadow over all the preservation efforts. This, he was an attorney for William Penn's family, for his sons, John and Thomas, and all his papers and those of the entire Chu family are located at the Historical Society, record group 2050. Um, and it includes records of provenance about the sofa, which is, owned by the National Trust and it's insured at a value of $10 million. So the, 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 the fancy furniture, the important Georgian architecture, which includes blood on the wall and, and bullet marks from the battle where hundreds of men died, um, really draws a lot of weight and gravity to understanding its place in American history. But my mother used to say, get off the sofa and make yourself use, useful. Clibden was for a long time all about the sofa and the choose and only about the battle. But the battle is only a few hours in the 300 year history. So what to do with the 240,000 documents of the Chu family papers? The Chu's were attorneys, so I guess they never threw things out like good attorneys. And hundreds of these boxes like this were given to the Historical Society of Pennsylvania beginning in 1982. And they were slowly painstakingly processed which got a huge boost only in the last 15 years when the Historical Society of Pennsylvania got an NEH grant to put archivists in spacesuits to vacuum the mold and carefully unfold these records. Uh, Benjamin Chu was not only an attorney, but he was also uh, one of the largest slave owners in the region. And many of his plantations were in Maryland and Delaware, including the largest plantation worked by an entire African uh, descent. Uh, labor force, the Whitehall Plantation, all these records are in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania as well. So how to tell these documents and these records responsibly with partners with an organization at Clibden, which was essentially uh, mostly Caucasian, and there were many true descendants on the board when we started this work. You could say that Clibden started its interpretive planning as a kind of diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion approach much earlier than we commonly think of. And that began in 2006 and gained steam as we got more of the documents accessible, scanned, and researchable. And really only to this date, about 20 to 25% of the documents have been thoroughly gone over. Um, so the research is an important part of effective public history because what we wanted to do was bring people in to what we're finding out in part because we didn't have all the perspectives we needed. So chapter one is about all these conversations that Germantown was having about the relevance of its historic sites and the histories and the historical narratives that had been passed down by the descendants, then to a subsequent group of professional curators and preservationists, um, very professional, but no less exclusive for a curatorial point of view um, and, you know, for instance, there wasn't a, a, a historic marker commemorating anything about Germantown's black history until 1987, when a, a marker was put in at the location of the Hill School, an African American school in the neighborhood on Rittenhouse Street. So what to do with these documents to involve the community 
in part because we were growing irrelevant in their eyes. And what we did was we started in concentric circles out from the board and the staff to build a community of trust with important stakeholders, institutional leaders, uh, neighborhood association groups. You know, Germantown has 39 registered community organizations. It has 90 churches and three mosques. And it has uh, 18 historic sites. It has 11 community development corporations. So collaboration is never easy, but Germantown you know, works very hard to do that. And we wanted this to be a collaborative approach in part because we didn't have all the perspectives. So we sent out postcards about slavery and the Chu family in Philadelphia to update people of what we were learning from these documents and to ask questions like, what surprises you? How should places like Clibden tell it? And we started with our public officials and their staffs, many of whom are very interested in history, pastors, community associations, uh, all were invited into these conversations. And when, we, and when the papers learned we were doing this, it, we landed on the front page of the Philadelphia Inquirer on a Sunday, uh, a Sunday a newspaper. Uh, uh, so it was a big story to see our uh, house or historic site on the front pages of a major metropolitan daily. And it was somewhat jarring to see this. But I thought it's actually kind of refreshing to see a museum on the front page of a major paper and it isn't being sued or closed or sold. It's actually about interpretation. And um, this prompted people to reach out to us, including from the folks who had been involved in the president's house uh, at uh, Independence Mall. Uh, which was a contentious uh, community enterprise and, and the results of the president's house sort of show that it's a kind of monument to contention as opposed to a co-authored space to consider shared uh, goals. Uh, so um, members of ATTACK, Avenging the Ancestors Coalition reached out to us, members of INCOBRA, the National uh, Council of Blacks for Reparations in America reached out to us and we said, come on in. We don't have all the perspectives we need. So this challenged our organization with our elderly guide corps and our education committee um, about you know, who, who all is gonna be involved in co-authoring our updated interpretation to tell all the stories we can about the plantation histories uh, as told in the documents. And the documents are very provocative. And what we did was we turned a rather staid program called the Cliveden Institute into an open dialogue involving public, you know, uh, historic speakers and scholars in a discussion with our community members about what we're learning about the papers. So it would begin with an update of research uh, as well as putting the research into a different context, depending on the speaker, which included people uh, uh, talking about women in enslavement or uh, the, uh, uh, the, the urban blight or uh, mulatto poetry uh, or uh, the, the memory infrastructure as a change of real, related to race, history, and memory. Uh, Elijah Anderson spoke at the Clifton Conversations about his work, uh, the, uh, the Code of the Street and the Iconic Ghetto. And we broke each group, uh, each audience uh, was, was required to introduce themselves, each audience member introduced themselves to a stranger that they didn't know when they entered the building, which meant that they had to get up and get out of their seat and go talk to a person of another uh, uh, across the room, often a person of a different color. And it sounds jarring, but this is really a key component of effective public history. You get people out of their comfort zone and engage them in a way. And then what happened, of course, is people couldn't sit down because they found out they had so many things in common with the stranger that they had just met. And after the presentations, we would encourage people to go and find their stranger and discuss with them what they had just heard and report back to us. So it really was conversations, plural. Uh, and we asked questions like, what surprised you? How should we tell it? What are you willing to do to help us? This was one of the exercises that helped now over the course of, I think, 45 conversations have taken place since 2011. Uh, and they continue to be a planning device for further programming for the Cliveden staff. And we get an incredible participation from uh, the community, including excellent ideas. Um, it also posed very basic questions 
And often we would have rancorous conversations and, and sometimes when the grant funding allowed it, we'd have a psychologist in the room or a psychiatrist to help us facilitate the conversations constructively. And it posed questions like, who's a founding father? We know Benjamin Chu helped found the, the, the Pennsylvania Constitution after the revolution, but uh, his enslaved African, Richard Allen, founded the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and he's a founding father as well. And while we can't put Richard Allen, who may have been born on the Whitehall Plantation in Delaware, or may have been born in Philadelphia, we can't put him through documentation at Clibden. Clibden can certainly interpret, it, interpret his historic role in the founding of America and founding of a uh, one of the largest Christian congregations of people of African descent in the world. Um, and he's enslaved by Benjamin Chu. Um, and it also puts different perspectives into the mix. This is uh, a historic, uh, uh, a couple of historic photographs. The one uh, uh, featuring James Smith uh, uh, leaning against the tree was only learned of in 2014. So it involved the, the conversational model of allows evolving uh, uh, research and updates to new information. But these are two images of the same person from 1867 and 1859. This was a man named James Smith born into enslavement in, a, in 1789 on a plantation near Chestertown, Maryland, who purchased his freedom and came to work at Clibden in 1813 until his death in 1870 behind the house carrying wood. He had actually lived in the kitchen dependency uh, on the Clifton property. And you see history depends on where you're standing. And here he is in his formal wear, uh, uh, as well as on, in his work clothes. And you tell me who owns the site. Look at that body language. So um, among the great suggestions that the planning, the programmatic planning device that is the conversations model gave us was a couple of people said, you know, you reenact the Battle of Germantown. What if you reenacted episodes from the plantation records of the Chu family plant, uh, records at HSP? And that suggestion opened up a lively series of project partnerships with New Freedom Theater and the Philadelphia Young Playwrights to work with teenagers in the documents and Clifton staff and historians on our board like Randall Miller and Erica Dunbar to come up with a dramatic experience, a script for a, a tour of the house through the lens of James Smith. He's your narrator, he's your guide who steps out of the image and guides you through a hundred years of Clifton's history through the lens of liberty and being asked uh, to give it up. The title is from a direct quote from a man named Joseph writing to Benjamin Chu, may I have liberty to go to see my wife on another plantation. And there are various ways that people in the dramatic experience of the house are seeking liberty. Some people sue for freedom like Charity Castle. Uh, some are asked to give up their house like Benjamin Chu during the revolution. Some are uh, slave catchers trying to find runaways and this scene uh, from the, the dramatic experience, uh, it, it, it recreates a slave catcher trying to talk a person out of escaping. And it, exper the experiences of the house entirely, including staircases and portions of the house that had previously been hidden from the public. So it reveals the house in new ways and dramatic arts really brought life to history in ways that you know, middle-aged historians might not necessarily be able to do. So the, the architecture nerds loved that the dramatic arts had uh, raised the level of creativity and imagination and the creative arts people never knew that architecture could be a character in an experience like this. So the ability to walk up the slaves and children's staircase, for instance, or into portions of the house with these dramatic episodes of seeking liberty were uh, quite dramatic. And, and some of you may have been able to experience it. It's even taken place in virtual format. It limits things to 20 people in the house. Um, uh, a, a key portion of the chapter or of the chapter goes to what we learned from the, uh, uh, the, the conversations related to revealing the historic kitchen. And this is covered in chapter five, which is a chapter entirely about empty buildings in Germantown. And it could be a long chapter, but it's really only about four empty buildings in Germantown, including the 1767 kitchen dependency. Um, I'm gonna, David, I'm gonna yeah. give you a second to 
take a breath because I wanted to just reflect on a lot of what you just talked about um, because you're clipped in conversations and all of the programming, you outline ways that we really can equip the um, participants in these conversations to have these challenging conversations. Um, I'm thinking about our frontline docents who have people on tours um, and how you reference in your book an event that happened at HSP in 2009 that was confrontational. Um, HSP staff was not prepared to have conversations with, um, with reparations group at that moment. How in now in 2021, 22, how do we equip like our docents, our frontline staff to have those conversations? How do we build trust in like a 45 minute tour? Just reflecting on lessons learned from the Cliveden conversations. And then I'll hand it back to you to, to keep going into Delaware. Sure. Um, it's a very important question and, and, and it, it's important work to orient uh, people to the experience that they're gonna have. So the image on the left in the Liberty to Go to Sea program is orienting the people to the difficult subject matters of enslavement, indentured servitude, and women's rights. And we did so in a way that you, uh, used a, a Simon Says game to, to disrupt people's sense of hierarchy and privilege to orient them that you're going to be dislodged from your normal comfort zone uh, with an exercise. Orienting people is really important. That's part of why the president's house fails in part because it doesn't orient folks to these kinds of juxtapositions that they're going to see when they consider the Liberty Bell or independence or the declaration of the constitution in independence hall. So people can largely handle uh, 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 difficult topics if they're going to be, if they're already oriented that that's gonna be part of it. Training our guides when we get pushback with things like, well, I only want, I don't wanna hear about the, the plantations. I only wanna hear about the battle of Germantown. And our guides would say, well, at Clifton, we cannot separate the war from independence from the struggle for freedom. Um, and also preparing the guides through, you know, uh, uh, the idea that you're not trying to change anyone's mind, but you want them to, you want to influence their thinking a little bit. And success would be measured by, I hadn't thought about it like that, as opposed to uh, more strict methods of evaluation. But all those things, evaluation, the journey map through the house, um, have to be taken into account intentionally and through training and having a psychiatrist involved helps. Meanwhile, in 2021, 22, there are far more organizations doing this kind of work and there are far more records and, and practical um, uh, programmatic elements that help folks do this. The work of Drayton Hall, for instance, and in engaging descendant communities or the Mount Pelier rubric for engaging descendant communities in research interpretation and community engagement are now all great tools that we can use in this work. And many places are, are using that by comparing notes or Julia Rose's work on empathy and the five R's mm -hmm. in the guided tour, research, reflection, reconsideration, rejection, and respect are all ways that we can equip guides with a vocabulary for steering the conversation, including giving guides a sense that they don't have to know everything. Right. Um, that we can be comfortable with a, a lack of 100% certainty because we don't know all we want to know about the past doesn't mean we can't tell some of it. And the most important thing is to humanize the people and to use things like active verbs and agency. It wasn't that the sofa was built. It's these four people moved the sofa in here every summer, the summer home of the Chu family at Cliveden. Tools like that can expand the interpretation and also uh, uh, the openness to, en to encourage a dialogue with visitors uh, so that their feedback becomes part of what you incorporate into lessons learned. There are a lot of lessons and they're all uh, very richly described in the, the chapter on conversations that uh, all of Germantown benefited from these kinds of group discussions and, and surveys and such. But um, it also involves a board commitment to do this kind of work. And uh, the board asked us very plain, pointedly, what are you gonna give up in order to focus on this? Um, and they also set the tone, which was simply, if this is the truth, 
we need to be the place that tells it. So when the tone is set from the top, many things can follow uh, with Thank that. Thank you. So why don't you keep talking about the discovery of the truth a little bit and some of the other research that you did in Germantown, but please let's get up to Delaware because I don't want to leave Absolutely. the book in 2019. Um, no problem. A lot that's well, here we are then. in, in 1928. Uh, um, and all I'll just say is briefly about this. This is uh, one of the most uh, uh, important years in Germantown history. Um, so iconic was the colonial that African-American women dressed as George and Martha at the Black Branch of the YWCA in February of 28. And then uh, just a few weeks later, uh, the Harlem Renaissance came to Germantown in a chapter called Amnesia. It's important to remember that even programs as powerful as Liberty to Go to See can be forgotten in places like Germantown. And this program brought the superstars of the Harlem Renaissance into Germantown for one week, uh, in part because uh, Germantown had a strong relationship with the National YWCA. And this was only the third Negro Achievement Week in the country. It's the forerunner of what became Black History Month, the brainchild of Carter Woodson. And it brought Elaine Locke, uh, uh, you know, the father of the Harlem Renaissance, and W.E.B. Du Bois and James Weldon Johnson, the head of the NAACP, into Germantown for a week of festival programming uh, that reached almost 4,000 people and had surveys. And this is all forgotten in historic Germantown. It's not in the archives of the Germantown Historical Society, but it is in the archives of the Y at the Urban Archives. And I found this, and in, in, in the research, we learned that um, the reason that Germantown was the location for Negro Achievement Week, uh, the first modern public history event in America, I argue in the book, the first two were in New York and Chicago. Well, why Germantown? Why not North Philly? Why not Broad Street? Is because Germantown had the largest membership of the KKK in the entire city of Philadelphia. In 1928, 1,200 members of the KKK resided in Germantown. And these Negro Achievement Weeks were an attempt to counter that presence in the late 1920s. There were crosses burned on Cliveden Street in the 1940s. So if you're in my position trying to make history relevant in a largely black community, running a slave owner's mansion, wouldn't you wanna know that the KKK was active into the modern memory of the 1940s? This didn't shock African-American residents of Germantown, but it did surprise them. And everyone else in the audience when we would hear about this was legitimately shocked. But all those descendant groups, the logical endpoint is the KKK. So that's in chapter two. Um, and all of Germantown is filled with incredible literature related to history in some way, including Bright April, a children's book about uh, uh, integrating an, a Browning troop. Chapter three covers the, the, the the provocative attempt, the, the, the controversial attempt to create a kind of colonial Williamsburg experience in Germantown that lasted uh, 30 years and basically broke the, the Germantown community apart in an attempt to, to install and impose a colonial experience in Germantown with a, a huge five-story parking garage, moving historic houses into a pedestrian mall and many other misguided efforts. Um, and chapter three is a, is, a, is a chapter that all have to take a look at. Um, it was known as the Second Battle of Germantown in 1967. Chapter four explores how the Johnson House, uh, which was preserved for its colonial connections to the revolution, became an underground railroad uh, uh, site and, and a national historic landmark on the Underground Railroad in the 1990s and the detective work and the social history and the varieties of things that had to merge. To make, German, to make the Johnson House the heart of historic Germantown. So it's both about the detective work of the, how the Underground Railroad operated through Germantown and also how this got to be found out through the architecture, through the social history, uh, uh, pathbreakers like Charles Bloxon, but also uh, quirky uh, um, components of the history that you may not have known that make the, the, the traditional Underground Railroad story one of a blend of uh, legend and tradition as well as fact. Uh, the last chapter is about empty buildings, uh, most notably Germantown Hall, uh, which is back in the news uh, with the potential for redevelopment plans. This will be a new battle. Uh, also, uh, the, the, the chapter describes the deaccessioning of Uppsala 
uh, that had been a failed historic house museum that became a successful preservation story when it was uh, protected by easements and put into private hands in uh, 2018. So uh, Uppsala can be both a, 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 a failure as a house museum, but also a success as an adapted new model. And that's an important message. Uh, and this is the uh, uh, artist takeover of the Clifton property in the kitchens in 2016. So uh, history depends on where you're standing. And the Delaware case in my, my three and a half years in Germantown were, or in, in Delaware, excuse me, three and a half years at the Delaware Historical Society, uh, we're trying to make Delaware history impossible to ignore. And that is especially important now since the president of the United States is from Delaware and from Wilmington. And here uh, we have nine buildings, eight of which are in Wilmington. Here we have Old Town Hall and the former Woolworths, which is our Delaware History Museum and Mitchell Center for African American Her Heritage with Secret Service snipers on the roof uh, next door to the Queen where the Biden transition team was meeting during uh, uh, this time last year. So I think the next book will be like a public history uh, uh, meets James Bond uh, spy story. Uh, it was quite remarkable to see the Secret Service coming through our uh, elevators every day during the transition. We're also making our documents more accessible uh, related to enslavement, we really invested in our 10th building, the digital infrastructure. This is an important program called Liberty in Our Grasp, which is bringing uh, documents related to enslavement, manumission documents, uh, runaway ads, uh, protests, or, or uh, 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 meeting announcements, or bills of sale about enslaved Africans in Delaware into the hands of teachers with partners at the Teaching Hard History Project of the Southern Poverty Law Center. It's scalable with uh, smaller historical societies, and this may be a way to partner with our partners at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Also, uh, uh, our ninth building is in historic Newcastle. It's the National Historic, Reed uh, National historic Landmark, the Reed House and Gardens. And this Saturday, artists take it over in, in ways where provocative artists uh, interpret the house through different lenses as we've expanded the interpretation of this building to include the indentured, the enslaved, and, and people in Newcastle who we didn't necessarily know about except through research and scholarship, casting a broad lens on the working class in a dockside community in historic Newcastle. Um, so this is uh, quite a, an event and uh, tickets are still available for Saturday, 4.30 uh, to 7.30 in Newcastle. Uh, it's not every historical society that has a center dedicated to African American heritage, but we have the Jane and Littleton Mitchell Center embedded in our uh, Delaware History Museum. And it's really the reason I took the job, a traditional historical society with a progressive component like the African American Heritage Center, which has celebrated its five year anniversary this year. So it's relatively new and it's become a real community hub. And the goal is to make it more of a regional connector. Uh, it's also a place where we do not shy away from the history that does not reflect well on us. That's an important component of effective public history. So the museum exhibits in the Mitchell Center include the histories of 1968 and the National Guard occupation of Wilmington, Delaware for nine months. Also the segregated school system in Delaware and its lasting impact, as well as its legacies of spectacle punishment, uh, like the whipping post, which was only taken down last year, last July in Georgetown, Delaware. And that's what gets me to a program I wanted to uh, just touch on briefly for Justina. Um, uh, it's the unequal justice in the first state. You know, Delaware prides itself on the first state and yesterday marked the anniversary of when it ratified the first 10 amendments to the constitution. That's why December 7th is Delaware day. And it's the first state to ratify the bill of rights, but it didn't ratify, it's not the first state in all the amendments because Delaware didn't ratify the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments until 1901. And it means that Delaware is a slave state that didn't secede from the union. So that contradiction of first state, but not in everything has dramatic consequences. And as a Southern state that never seceded from the union, a border state, it wasn't required to report incidents of racial violence to the federal government. Uh, and that means that lynchings were not reported to the federal government, which presents a dramatic irony in that 
Delaware native Brian Stevenson, the man who grew up in Georgetown and could only go to, and he's my age, could only go to high school in Wilmington because it was the only high school that would allow African Americans. He had an hour and a half bus ride each way in, in a, as a high school in, in the 70s and 80s. He founded the Equal Justice Initiative, which includes this unbelievably powerful installation, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which uh, memorializes victims of lynching, 4,400 victims of lynching, as recorded from 1877 to 1950. It does not include any representatives from the state of Delaware. It has Pennsylvania, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, but Delaware is not represented, and we know that there are lynchings. So the irony of a Delaware native founding a place with no Delaware was not lost on people who would go and visit that because they saw that our scholarly journal of record, the Delaware History Journal, had had articles and scholarship related to lynchings, uh, such as uh, the, the, uh, the lynching in 1903 of George White uh, in Price's Corner, Newcastle County, a man burned alive in front of thousands and thousands of people. And the, art, the, uh, uh, the, the lack of representation in the National Memorial prompted a statewide partnership that um, my organization and the Mitchell Center have led that now involves the Delaware State University, the uh, historically Black College of Delaware, University of Delaware, and a grassroots coalition called the Delaware Social, Member Social Justice Remembrance Coalition, which includes uh, public officials and grassroots groups who've done their own digging and came up with our articles or have, have reached out to descendants and, and the Equal Justice Initiative. So it meant we could change and update the memory infrastructure of Delaware to include racial violence. And here was a record of the George White lynching in 2019, which includes uh, uh, taking a soil sample that's then uh, brought to the Equal Justice Initiative. So it's a very powerful experience. And we read the marker aloud as a group, so it's experiential. Uh, and there were 200 people at this event in June in 2019. And three weeks later, the sign was stolen. So we hurried up a replacement marker and public officials told me, David, we're gonna get the biggest frickin' historic marker imaginable. Um, so we replaced the marker in a very powerful and moving ceremony in November of 2019. And we have other findings and other scholarship that points us to other lynchings, including an article published this year by Dr. Yahoo Williams. So we're working with communities in Smyrna on uh, really doing justice to a, a new historic marker, but also healing and, and dialogue-based programs to bring descendants of the victims, the perpetrators, and the witnesses uh, into com conversation about this. So this is an important project, and it's, it's even more timely than ever, and it's a good way that many of the lessons of effective public history are present in my current work at the Delaware Historical Society. So I really wanna thank you. I know I've gone a little bit over uh, Justina, but um, there's a hundred thousand words in this book and uh, I would uh, definitely like you uh, to take a look at it. Uh, the footnotes are especially revealing. Um, and uh, it really is an attempt to put public, uh, the, put the social aspect of public history front and center. We can't tickle ourselves. We are social beings. Similarly, we can't uh, you know, know all we wanna know about the past and we can know more about it in engaging in dialogue, dialogue with others and sharing our perspectives about the past. This is meaningful work. And at night, I give thanks for meaningful work, even the nights I wake up screaming. Thanks very much, Justin. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. Um, I will just say that we had love in the Q&A for the Spotify playlist uh, dance party analogy. <laughs> and I think that comes right back to what you just said about we need each other and we need each other around the table. Um, and we make public history when we have multiple perspectives. Um, you touched very briefly at the end on descendants. We did have a question from Alicia about whether or not the two descendants were uh, involved in the work that you did. And um, if you want to talk a little bit more about how, again, how you bring people around the table who are directly involved historically in the organization as well as outside of the organization. 
Yes, the, the Chus were very much involved, including the Chus on our board. Uh, the late John Chu especially was an officer of the Cliveden board. And we had three board retreats during one year to wrestle our uh, interpretive planning into uh, a, a, a zone of comfort. I, I want to point out that none of the projects I described or described in the book were planned. They evolved organically. So much of the work with any of the stakeholders and not all stakeholders are created equal, but the work with any of the stakeholders involved their participation in a way to encourage them to see that this was bigger than any one stakeholder. It's bigger than the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. It's bigger than the Chu family descendants. It's bigger than the National Trust for Historic Preservation. It's bigger than the neighbors in Germantown or the Boy Scout troop, the African-American Boy Scout troop that conducted nine Eagle Scout projects in helping the preservation project. And the Chus were especially important in a key way in part because not all Chus realized that their family uh, were enslavers. So in the early uh, conversations about liberty to go to sea, the teenage playwrights workshopped episodes with professional actors in the conversations. It was, it was Juneteenth, 2012, I believe, or 2013. And the, 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 the professional actors were workshopping and in the conversation were, um, were six Chu descendants who had come from Kentucky and Texas to see the family homestead as a Father's Day weekend special event. They had no idea that they were the, um, uh, dis that their ancestors had plantations in Maryland and Delaware, and they sat with the playwrights. And basically their response was, was similar to all the Chews, which is don't put a bullseye on any one family, consider it in a larger context, don't impose a 21st century morality on the past, um, and yet let's tell all the stories. Uh, if this is the truth, let's be the place that tells it. That was John Chu's specific phrase. And he said, you know, in an era when there's a black man in pres as a president, um, we need a new way of talking about this. And if it, in Philadelphia wasn't, until the president's house, wasn't used to publicly proclaiming mm -hmm. things like Quakers own slaves or uh, 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 that slavery is an important, that 6% of Pennsylvania's population was enslaved Sleep. in 1780. Right. So these sorts of things started the ball rolling and bringing people along, including traditional audiences, uh, can be done by taking their perspectives seriously and their concerns, listening as much as giving facts. Yep, yep. If this is the truth, let's be the place that tells it. We have a great question um, from Phoebe in the, in the Q&A as well, talking about churches and the work that churches can and need to do around uh, uncovering their pasts. She's talking about St. Luke's in Germantown yeah. in particular and St. Yeah. Barnabas. Um, I guess um, the question is, so beyond just the specificity of Germantown, what are some quick lessons or um, next steps for a church or uh, another social community organization that wants to unpack its history? What's their first step? I would say uh, like... <laughs> it, well, yeah, go good, re good research. Here's what we know. A, re a, responsible, a responsible process, uh, clear goals on what you want from the public engagement. Um, and the, uh, uh, you know, churches are especially important in the collection of history. You know, the, the lesson of Uppsala is not that, you know, declining attendance is because people aren't interested in history. It's because we're not engaging. Right. And, I, you know, you can find in the church basement more history than in many historical societies because someone is collecting the notebook of clippings or there's a monument or historic marker to those who served in this or that war uh, in the church. But also churches evolve. And, you know, his, uh, sociologists like Katie Day in Germantown looked at the 90 churches on Germantown Avenue and the three masjid, masjids that are also on Germantown Avenue. And they adapt. Uh, she uses the hermit crab uh, analogy because congregations can share spaces. Uh, many of them are older uh, churches, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the organization, uh, say, uh, um, the sacred places, uh, uh, saving sacred places uh, helps congregations strengthen themselves to preserve their buildings. That's an important uh, um, place to start. 
Uh, but churches have a, a large role in part because they can be places to convene discussions. And right. one of the programs in the conversations chapter is called Germantown Speaks. And that became a collaboration with nine of the churches in Germantown to bring teenagers and elders from the community into conversation about what Germantown means to them. And those conversations um, met and they were filmed. They meant that we got up from the table a little bit closer community because we were in dialogue. Right. And so I that's another example where what seems difficult or challenging, if you bring the group together, yeah. mm -hmm. you can achieve, affect a different perspective. And uh, those conversations uh, ultimately started to talk about things that are uncomfortable, like when did the knife, uh, when did the gang fights turn from knives to guns? When did right. the crack arrive? Uh, right. Where do the kids go to see the movies because all the great movie houses on German Down Avenue are now closed? So those conversations mean that it's a great time for organizations like ours, as difficult as the history may be to on, encounter, young people are engaged in it, performing arts, dramatic arts, spoken word, uh, technology can be deployed in various ways. We're having a virtual meeting, we're, we're bringing people together and no one's complaining about uh, parking. Uh, you know, so th there are ways that there's a, there, these, are, these are times of optimism. Multiple generations talking about difficult history is, is one of the roles that churches can play. And I think there are a lot of resources. I, I think of the Tracing Center and Libby Brown's work um, of engaging churches in exactly the conversations that you outline in your conversations chapter, applying the same exact um, approaches. We are just about out of time. Um, I want to respect everybody else's time as well. I also want to just say there is plenty more to read in it. David touched very briefly on some of it, um, but all of these lessons learned are in the book. So if you are part of a church or a community organization or a preservation group in your community, um, it makes a great holiday gift. It's the time to start ordering those um, and read it and check it out. And also, David is inviting you to send him feedback. We will include his contact information on the follow-up email that we will send out, which will also have a survey so that you can share your ideas and your questions directly with him and get the conversations going in your neighborhood as well. Uh, so thank you, David. Thank you for all of your time tonight. Thank you for your you know, expertise and your contributions to the field. Um, I also want to thank uh, friends from Delaware Historical Society who joined us tonight. So thank you for partnering with us on this. And also thank you to all of our HSP friends out there who are members. I want to remind you that Monday evening is our annual meeting where you get to attend and vote on um, matters of the, of the organization, as well as hearing from Jane Calvert, who is doing work on John Dickinson's papers. So another new look at a, uh, a founding father and what might be hidden in those many, many, many boxes of John Dickinson's paper. Delaware history, impossible to ignore, I'm telling you. Um, if you are not a member and you want to join, uh, please go to our website and uh, hsp.org and join us so you can get free admission to programs like this and free admission to the library, which is open for research, um, to make an appointment and come to see it, go to hsp.org and we will have a very productive 2022, I think, in the field of public history. Again, David, thank you. Thank you, Justina. Best wishes to everybody and uh, thank you for all the work you're doing in your communities to help give life to history. Thank you all. Have a good evening and be well.